die of pestilence anymore? Sadly, as we all know now, yes, we do. But what is especially sad for a science journalist like me who writes about disease for a living is that this pandemic has not exactly been a surprise. Scientists have been warning for decades, with mounting urgency, that this was going to happen. And journalists like me have been relaying their warnings that a pandemic is coming and that we aren't prepared. How did we find ourselves in this situation? In short, there are more and more people, and too many of them have had to put ever-increasing pressure on natural systems to get the food and jobs and living space they need. That means pushing into wilderness that harbors new infections and intensifying food production in ways that can breed disease. COVID-19, Ebola, and worse come from destroying forests. Worrying flu strains and antibiotic-resistant bacteria come from livestock. Yet, we have neglected to invest in the things that discourage infectious disease. Public health, decent jobs and housing, education, sanitation. Then, the impact of the new pathogens we unearth is magnified by our ever-increasing global connectedness as we crowd into cities and trade and travel in an ever-denser global network of contact. So once public health fails and contagion appears anywhere, it goes everywhere. We know so much about beating disease Yet, fragmented governing structures, lack of global accountability, and persistent poverty in so many places ensure that those failures happen and disease propagates. Despite all that, we know what we need. Much better understanding of potentially pandemic infections, fast detection of new outbreaks, and ways to respond to them quickly. I'll be looking at that in this book. So far, we haven't been able to do that effectively, where it is most needed. In 2013, two labs, one Chinese, one American, investigated a tribe of bat viruses that are almost certainly the source of COVID-19. They immediately recognized the threat. One lab called them pre-pandemic and a threat for future emergence in human populations. The other wrote that they remain a substantial global threat to public health. Nothing was done. We could have learned more about them, designed some vaccines, looked into tests and treatment, studied ways these viruses might infect human populations, and shut those down. None of that happened. It was no one's job to take on those tasks with this kind of threat, even when it materialized. Yet, we needed so much to be in place if one of these viruses went global, which one did. You don't need to be told. Testing, ventilators, drugs, vaccines, protective gear for doctors and nurses, a plan for using old-fashioned quarantine and isolation to stop this kind of virus from spreading, a plan for dealing with the economic impact, Measures to contain the virus so we might not even need those things. Experts and governments have been talking intensively about pandemic preparation for nearly two decades, and still we weren't prepared. And this kind of virus wasn't, and isn't, even the only viral threat out there. Yet we're just as unprepared for the others. I wrote the following for New Scientist magazine in 2013, the year the COVID-like viruses were discovered, about a visit to the World Health Organization's then shiny new situation room and what might happen if H7N9 bird flu, the virus causing concern at the time, went pandemic. As it stands, the World Health Organization's top brass will watch any H7N9 pandemic unfold from their strategic operations center. Information will flood in, body counts will mount, governments will be told that their demands for vaccines and drugs cannot be met. They will issue declarations, hold briefings, organize...